This is a qualitative biomechanical analysis of resisted locomotion by Kaylee Vandervoort. In this presentation, I'm going to go over resisted sprinting and how we could use that to enhance sports performance, especially in the acceleration phase of sprinting. A little biomechanical refresher before we get into the, the notes here. We're going to talk about work, kinetic energy, power, the work energy principle, Newton's laws of motion, and of course how resisted sprinting is going to impact acceleration. Work is essentially a product of some force applied with some displacement. So force times displacement of an object along a line of action. So at the sprinter, we're going to see work done as the sprinter is moving themselves forward with resistance. They are producing kinetic energy based on their mass and the velocity. And then the power that they produce is going to be how much work they can get done in a certain amount of time. Newton's laws of motion tell us from the second law that force equals mass times acceleration. As we increase the acceleration, or mass of the sprinter, we're increasing the force required. The physiological adaptation of this is a greater capacity to produce force. So the sprinter is going to see that with the resistance, they're able to produce more force so that when they remove that resistance band, they're able to increase essentially their acceleration. Newton's third law of motion says that increased opposing force against the sprinter requires greater force by the sprinter. We're looking at that equal and opposite force. So essentially, as we increase the velocity of the sprinter, we're increasing increasing their kinetic energy. This increase in the change of kinetic energy means that we'll have an increase in the work output. Increase in work equals increase in force produced. We want to increase our work with less time and get greater power. I'm going to mainly cover the acceleration temporal phase of sprinting. The specificity of resisted sprinting is that it's most beneficial to the acceleration phase and not necessarily the other phases. This is mainly because the minimum and maximum angles are specific to sprinting, as in their hip angle and their knee angle. We'll go over this. Resisted sprinting is velocity and movement specific, and resisted sprinting gives a similar firing rate and synchronization of motor units. Essentially, resisted sprinting is going to help develop horizontal force production during the propulsive stance phase of sprinting. So the objective of resisted locomotion, in our case resisted sprinting, is going to be to develop greater force production in the musculature during the acceleration phase of sprinting using power training. This is essentially in the first 10 meters of the sprint. We're going to do this by developing velocity in less time to get greater acceleration. So kinematically what we're looking for is step length and step frequency to look at our velocity. We want to increase the length and frequency to increase the velocity. There are two components of the gait that we're going to look at, which is the stance phase when the foot actually contacts the ground and the swing phase when the ipsilateral foot goes from foot strike to toe off. The phases of acceleration that we're going to examine are from the takeoff through the flight phase and into the landing phase. This is a cyclical motion in sprinting. In the stance phase, we're going to see the foot break and then propel itself. During acceleration, we mainly see propulsion with minimal braking forces this is because we're trying to increase the velocity as much as possible. We're going to analyze the left foot from takeoff to the next left foot takeoff. So which muscles are moving and getting shorter? This would be concentric shortening. Which muscles are moving and getting longer, like eccentric lengthening? Which muscles are applying force but have no movement in an isometric contraction? So mainly in what we see in resistive sprinting is the concentric muscle action produces positive work which results in an increase in mechanical ener energy. This is because the pulling force by the person produces positive work because the displacement of the object is in the same direction of the force that the body exerts. We see some eccentric muscle action through the cycles and we'll go over that. And then isometric action in the ankle mainly and again we'll go over that. As the person goes through their takeoff flight and landing phase, potential energy is created as we see an increase in vertical displacement. This is also due to the potential energy in the connective tissues as the body accelerates. We have stored elastic energy during stance, which increases during the stride length. The center of gravity is moving up and down in a wave and essentially creating this potential energy. The total mechanical energy of the sprinter is the sum of the potential kinetic and strain energies, which in this case is increasing. As I explained, this is mainly due to the concentric contractions that create torque in the joints as the person accelerates in the same direction as the observed motion. So here is the video of the sprinter. I'll show you a normal speed first and then we'll slow it down.
an anterior view. And then slow down in 1 8 speed. And what we see here is a rapid acceleration of the hip flexor, rapid acceleration of knee flexion. Again, these are the concentric actions. Rapid acceleration of shoulder flexion. Rapid acceleration of plantar flexion of the calf. And mechanical work, positive mechanical work, as the displacement is in the same direction as the force being produced. The hip, knee, ankle, and shoulder are the joints most notably involved in the acceleration phase of sprinting. During acceleration, what we see is that the left ankle undergoes a rapid dorsiflexion with the foot's impact on the ground. The biggest motion, again, for propulsion will be when the plantar flexors concentrically work to rapidly accelerate at the ankle and get that push off. Again, the gastrocnemius and the soleus and the, the calf muscles are most notably involved in this plantar flexion. At the hip, like I explained, we're going to see a big rapid acceleration of the hip flexors as the hip moves concentrically into flexion. We'll see the hip slow down as the hip extensors begin to contract. And then we'll again see the flexors concentrically contract at the end of the phase. So the hip has the most drive as we go from extension into flexion using the hip flexors. The muscles most notably involved are the hip flexors, you can see them here, that move that hip into flexion and help propel forward. Hip extensors are involved as we extend the hip through that cyclical phase of acceleration. At the knee, we're going to see acceleration with concentric action of the knee flexors. It will again slow down in the flight phase with eccentric contraction of the flexors. And again, as the foot touches down, we're gonna see the extensors concentrically work and the flexors eccentrically slow down. There's rapid acceleration at the knee during each phase of acceleration. The flexors that are most involved are the hamstrings, so the gracilis and the sartorius kick in, and even the gastrocnemius of the calf. The extensors of the knee are the quadriceps. At the shoulder, we're going to see extension using a concentric contraction, moving into hyperextension of the shoulder as the arm swings back. We'll see the flexors start to eccentrically slow this down, and then the flexors concentrically work to propel us forward. The main shoulder flexor muscles are the deltoids, pecs, coracobrachialis, and biceps brachii. The shoulder extensors most notably involved are the lats, deltoid, pec major, teres major, and triceps brachii. Again, that shoulder excursion, we could see the left shoulder from full shoulder extension coming into shoulder flexion, which, which helps to create the acceleration in that positive direction. Kinematically, we're going to look at joint angles. Why is this correct? Again, we'll slow it down a little bit. What we can see in the kinematics is that the initial acceleration, the body should be at a 45 degree angle and will become more upright. Here, the subject is at about 48 degrees, so just a little bit upright. We'd see a little bit more flexion in the hip um, to make this just a little bit more bi biomechanically correct. The foot strike thigh angle should be between 20 and 30 degrees, according to Cronin and Hansen, um, at the 30 meter mark, so just a little bit after the acceleration phase. And here she's um, just right in the middle, right at about 23 degrees. The knee flexion at foot strike should be around 30 to 35 degrees. And here we see kind of the first discrepancies. She's around 58 degrees or 58 degrees from neutral at 122. We'll see an increasing angle as the knee absorbs the ground reaction force. And again, the greatest knee flexion will be at foot strike during the acceleration phase. The increased knee flexion angle is going to give us a shorter lever arm, which is going to produce greater speed and rapid acceleration at the hip. And here we can see she's about 63 degrees of flexion in the knee, uh, which is on par with most of the research. To increase her velocity and get greater acceleration, we want to reduce the knee extension angle and increase stride frequency. As I explained, the greatest muscle firing uh, that we'll see during this resisted acceleration is in the quadriceps, gluteals, hamstrings, and calves. We can test the muscles if we see any strength discrepancies 
using manual muscle testing and isolated muscle actions. So in the gluteus maximus, we perform a prone hip extension and find that the glutes fail to fire in extension, then we could work on strengthening that muscle. Additionally, core strength is incredibly important in resisted sprinting to maintain a rigid spine throughout the motion. There's manual muscle testing for the lower abdominals and also a plank hold could be used to test the core strength. Some protocols if we see a discrepancy in strength would be to help strengthen the muscles that fire the most, so the gluteals, quadriceps, hamstrings. According to Cronin and Hansen, this can be done by gym-based exercises such as a front hack squat, power cleans, and Olympic lifts. Of course, this resisted sprinting comes at a cost. There's a huge injury risk uh, if you're not conditioned for sprinting. The hamstrings are most commonly injured in sprinting. Uh, this is because they're performing two actions, flexing the knee and extending the hip simultaneously. So there's a huge force production. As well, there's also a force that's produced to decelerate the leg while it's lengthening during the swing phase. So we have a large eccentric load and high velocity lengthening. This causes strain. We'll also see that hamstrings shorten when the knee is flexing. Of the muscles, the biceps femoris is most injured because it's stretched the most. We can prevent these hamstring strains by getting an ample warm-up with mobility exercises that are conducive to the acceleration phase, so hip mobility, calf mobility. We could perform in the gym exercises that help to provide fatigue resistance, so staying in the 12 to 15 rep range, doing eccentric loading with an exercise like a Romanian deadlift. And we also want to look for any inflexibility or strength deficiencies before we add resistance to the sprinting. With resisted sprinting, improving that acceleration phase will see benefits to sports performance. And this is in any sport that covers short distances in rapid time and involves a lot of acceleration. So sports like football, rugby, soccer, basketball, and of course sprinting. The use of resistance sprinting is mainly for developing greater force production in the musculature during the acceleration phase of sprinting. We'll see an increase in lower body strength and power. We'll see an increase in the horizontal stretch shortening cycle. We could see hypertrophic changes in the muscle. Resistance sprinting can be done with multiple forms, including parachutes, weighted vests, and sled pulling. So it's not limited to just using resistance band, although that's a convenient and inexpensive option. What we really want to make sure to do with resistance sprinting is avoid something like this. Thank you so much for listening to this lecture.